Okay, we'll begin. So we are uh, into the middle of uh, chapter eight of the deep learning course, which is uh, on optimization algorithms. We finished chapter seven was about regularization strategies. Uh, chapter eight is optimization, and chapter nine is going to be on convolutional neural networks. Um, this is an essential part of any deep learning project where you're going to learn from a data set. Of course, today uh, in quite a few projects, you already take a uh, embedding available by somebody else who has done the learning part of it. And you're just using the embeddings uh, for a particular task you, you are interested in. But if you were to create a embedding that is a learned representation, uh, this is what you would have to do. You would need an optimization algorithm. We talked about uh, what is backpropagation, the backpropagation algorithm. But that has all uh, made its way into standard optimization algorithms. Uh, there are about half a dozen of them available. So uh, you can use a standard stochastic gradient descent as an optimization method, which uh, whose job is to um, uh, take some uh, loss function, such as uh, the sum of squared errors or cross entropy to find the settings of the parameters or the weights in the network that is going to minimize that quantity, right? The stochastic gradient is a method where uh, we use uh, batches, many batches of data to uh, proceed in the direction that uh, uh, would uh, would take the gradient uh, into account and uh, you, you descend opposite to the uh, value of the uh, direction of the gradient. Uh, and um, uh, that takes you to the to a direction of the minimum at least. So there is stochastic gradient descent. There is um, also a version that kind of speeds up stochastic gradient descent called the moment method, which says rather than zigzagging in the uh, in the directions of the coordinates to uh, proceed in a in in a, in a direction <coughs> where you have some momentum. So you compute that, so there's a momentum method. And there's a variation of that momentum method called the nestor of uh, uh, momentum, which is um, some correction to the basic momentum method. So we, we have to look at first stochastic gradient descent momentum method, nestor of momentum. And then from there, we move to what are called as adaptive methods, which uh, say that uh, we should change the step size, the learning rate, uh, based on the nature of the surface you are dealing with, and uh, and that uh, it gives rise to a whole uh, set of uh, methods for optimization. Uh, some of the names of the methods are um, uh, something called Ada Grad and RMS Prop, and there is also um, there is also uh, uh, the Adam Optimizer, so on. So there are half a dozen different optimization methods. Um, we just want to get a sense for uh, what, what do these optimization methods do. And after we finish these five or six different methods of optimization, the standard optimization methods with momentum, and then there is all these adaptive uh, optimization methods. Uh, there are also what are called as second order methods, which uh, look at not just the first derivative when you're doing gradient descent, but also take into account the second derivative of the loss function. Uh, to learn better as to the nature of the surface you're dealing with. So it takes into account not just the gradient, but also the curvature of the surface uh, with the hope of uh, directly proceeding to the minimum. That's a very interesting thing, that if you formulate your loss function, uh, it's typically stated as J of theta. Theta is all the set of parameters, J is the loss function. And uh, you pick a particular point and you expand the loss function around that point, you apply a Taylor series of all things, standard Taylor series you apply, which takes around any point you, you express the value of the function in terms of the first derivative, second derivative, third derivative. So that's what Taylor series tells you. Uh, it turns out that the first and second derivatives have a lot of information. The third one you can ignore. So the second derivative comes into play and you come up with a, a direct formulation, can't we just jump from where we are into the right point? It, you know, theoretically speaking, if, if the second derivative is well behaved, it's called the Hessian matrix, you can directly jump to the minimum, right? So 
eliminating all these gradient descent steps. That sounds really powerful. Uh, of course, conditioned upon whether the Hessian is well behaved and so on, the second derivative is well behaved. So we have all these first derivative methods and then second derivative methods. And then of course, <laughs> the question comes up is, which one should I use? There aren't very clear cut answers to uh, what is the best optimization method. As we go along, we see there are some advantages here, disadvantages here, and people say, so on certain data sets, this seems to do well and so on. And then, of course, there are some heuristics people have given. Uh, and there is also the issue of uh, where do we start? What is the starting point uh, for uh, optimization? Because they're all iterative methods. They're not closed form solutions. They're iterative methods. So how do we initialize these parameters? So which is the starting point? And there is a set of methods uh, that are suggested and uh, and one could say uh, use some of one of these methods um, and all of these uh, uh, methods i mentioned are all available to you uh, in any kind of uh, a deep learning framework that you're working with whether it's pytorch or keras and so on uh, i I'll, i've got a few slides here which kind of show you how to invoke every one of these methods all right so um, so all of them are available as libraries and uh, you could try using any of these things. So we're just looking at under the hood a little bit to see what exactly goes on if you chose, let's say you chose the Adam optimizer. What is under the Adam optimizer? So that is what this lecture is about. And I think it is a very essential, important topic for deep learning to know about optimization. Uh, it's like uh, for uh, somebody studying uh, automobiles to uh, spend at least one lecture talking about how does the internal combustion engine work, right? I mean, you may not need it to run the car or to, to write this uh, code for the AI machine learning application you have, but I think it's worthwhile to ha just have a sense of what goes on in these optimizers. Uh, these optimizers all deal with a loss function too, so that is another thing you'd be aware of. So that's what this topic is about, and some of the algorithms get a little complicated, as the nature of optimization, but they're not really all that formidable. Okay, so the topic where we are today is uh, we've kind of looked at uh, the earlier parts, optimization, machine learning, how learning differs from optimization, challenges in neural networks. We have a number of issues about uh, vanishing gradients and so on. So today we're looking at stochastic gradient descent momentum, nest drop momentum, parameter initialized strategies is the next set of slides. And then uh, this is another important one, these methods here called uh, methods with uh, adaptive learning rates. And then we have approximate uh, second order methods, uh, which we look at, uh, which I just mentioned, what those are. Okay, so that's the range of things we're doing. Again, uh, this is a slide just taken from uh, basic machine learning and uh, gradient descent follows a gradient of the entire training set downhill. If this uh, blue curve, the blue dotted curve is the loss function we are uh, dealing with, and these are the settings of the parameter. This is the parameter we have here. X is a parameter in this case. And we are trying to find the minimum of that. And uh, if we are on the uh, starting somewhere on the left side, if, if the parameter is set to be on the left side, then we have to increase the value of the parameter to, uh, to go to the minimum. If you are on the right side, uh, we have to decrease the value of the parameter to go to this side. So we have to compute the value of the gradient. You know, in this case, we compute the value of the gradient and for x less than zero, we have f prime of x, in this case, less than zero. And so we have to decrease f by moving rightward. So we always take the negative here. For x greater than zero, we have f prime of x is increasing function here, is, uh, is greater than zero. So I have to decrease f by moving backward. So it's always going the opposite direction. If the gradient is positive, we go in the negative direction. If the gradient is negative, we go in the positive direction. That's where the negative comes into play. This shows for the simple function, which is f of x equal to one half of x squared, the derivative equal to f. And so they're plotted here, and the nature of nature of the value of the derivative is it negative or positive? So this kind of motivates uh, why we're taking the negative of the gradient. So uh, in stochastic gradient descent, we accelerated by mini batches downhill rather than look at the entire loss function over the entire data set we're looking at, at small mini batches and it is uh, widely used for machine learning in general and for deep learning and uh, average gradient on a mini batch is the estimate of the gradient 
So it brings in a little bit of noise and that itself is considered a method of regularization. So uh, the so throughout in each of these slides, so we have an algorithm for uh, each method. This is the SGD algorithm. We are computing a gradient estimate and we, have, we apply the uh, apply the update uh, where we take the negative of the gradient. We say we motivated why that is negative. And, uh, and uh, so this is the crucial parameter, the learning rate. We talk about it, iteration k, the learning rate is epsilon k. You know, there is a lot of discussion about hyperparameters in deep learning. And, uh, and and the general advice people give is, if there is one hyperparameter you want to select carefully, it is the learning rate. There's so many others there. So this is considered to be a, an important hyperparameter to work with. So these are some, some pretty pictures here, choice of learning rate. Uh, if it is too small a learning rate, you're just, uh, the small learning rate takes forever. You're kind of moving in small steps at a time. You're changing the values of the parameters. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you take a very large learning rate, a starting point, you're jumping over here, and then from here, you're jumping over here. You have missed the, uh, overshot the minimum. If you have a large learning rate, you might. so it is going to be, uh, it'll, uh, if it is too large, the next point will perpetually bounce haphazardly across the bottom of the well. So we don't want haphazard jumping and we don't want it to be too slow as the first one is saying. So we have uh, these issues and then the, the third diagram here is the, is the Goldilocks, the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. It's the right, uh, right approach uh, and we have the right uh, uh, method and is actually, as you can see, it is taking uh, smaller and smaller steps in this case. So. Um, if the gradient, is, okay, there's another uh, advice. If gradient is small, then you can safely try a larger learning rate, which compensates for the small gradient and results in the large steps. You see, we are multiplying the learning rate with the gradient. So in that sense, uh, because it's a product of the two. So anyway, these are all some general things that you can find in the, in the literature about um, the choice of the learning rate. And... Uh, in practice, what happens? Um, this is, these are some things I saw with uh, Keras, which is, uh, I suppose, a library that goes with TensorFlow, right? Is, is Keras associated with PyTorch? No, it's, it's, it's a TensorFlow thing, yeah. All right, so those are the competing things. Google product and the Facebook product. PyTorch is on the side of Facebook. All right, uh, Keras provides SGD class to implement SGD optimizer with learning rate and momentum. Okay, so these seem to go together. Uh, and uh, from Keras Optimizer, this is the kind of uh, code they have. Optimizer is equal to SGD, model compile, and uh, the optimizer here is whatever you've set, SGD, stochastic rating descent. And uh, the default learning rate is 0 0.01 and no momentum is used. So if you simply use SGD, uh, what is the learning rate then? It's 0 0.01 and uh, no momentum is used. Yeah. Yeah, this one here. Okay. Yeah, that is exactly um, the kind of approach that uh, the second order methods do. To compute curvature, you need more than the gradient. You need like second order, next step also you need to look at. Uh, and uh, that's a whole set of methods based on the Hessian. You have to compute the second derivative and use take curvature into account. And that's exactly how they do. But then there are also caveats. They're also saying uh, the Hessian has got to be something called positive definite Hessian. So there's all these things, the uh, surface. We're not talking about just a little well in a one-dimensional thing. We're talking about uh, what's called a saddle point. Like on a horse, you put a saddle point. Uh, so there are all these uh, points that you have to deal with. So which way, which way do you go? Which, which way is, is, is less? Uh, so there are all these, uh, and then plateaus and all these issues come into play. So uh, uh, so even to apply the second uh, derivative, the curvature information can be a, can be complicated. Okay, so there is second derivative methods. Why are we uh, dealing with all of this? Again, is uh, you might find the training to be to be hard. It becomes a little bit of a, a trial and error type of thing now. Saying okay, you try this out. And uh, maybe uh, what if I tried out uh, another method? 
and so on, uh, different starting points. We already saw that that's a bagging method, right? Try out different starting points and see how you do and then combine the results and so on. So anyway, all of that exists. So we, right now we're just doing a, doing a uh, taxonomy. Like here is a one method, here is another method, here is another method and so on. So that's what it is. And some of them have become very popular. RMS prop or Adam optimizer become very, very popular. But uh, anyway, nice to be aware of these things so you can try them out uh, yourself. All right, so there is an argument now. The learning rate should not be fixed, like that epsilon should not be the same. And you should make the learning rate smaller. Uh, and uh, uh, and so, but if the uh, true gradient of total cost function becomes small and then zero, we can use the fixed learning rate. But we are saying uh, you are not working with a true gradient. Uh, you are working uh, with uh, with a uh, with stochastic gradient descent. So we are working not with the gradient function that has been computed over uh, uh, all of the data points. We have a mini batch version of it. So depending on the particular sample, your the the value of the loss function can be noisy. And um, so we are we are doing a random sampling of M training samples. And under these conditions, sufficient condition for uh, stochastic gradient descent conversions is these, uh, some of all these uh, learning rates, uh, k equal to one through infinity is infinite. Okay, that's large. But then the, for the squared value, that should be less than infinity. All right, so these are the conditions here. And uh, so to achieve this, the uh, learning rate is uh, decayed linearly. For iteration tau, we have uh, epsilon k, that is the learning rate step k is in terms of uh, step zero, and there is some alpha. This alpha is the step size uh, k divided by the uh, iteration t, so it's kind of making it smaller and smaller. After iteration uh, t, it is common to leave the epsilon constant, and uh, it's a small uh, value in the range zero to one point. Oh, so there are some heuristics given over here based on experimentation. And apparently Keras actually provides all of this for you. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, we just saw that equation, uh, DK learning rate. This is showing how we are taking shorter and shorter steps as we are approaching the minimum. Uh, and, uh, and apparently this is available in, in Keras in this way. The learning rate is the initial learning rate times one over one plus dk, there's a dk factor going on here, which is, I believe, the alpha there, where L rate is the learning rate, uh, initial L rate is specified as an argument, dk is the dk rate, which is greater than zero, iteration the current update number. So this is provided. So you have now, um, again, a, an invocation within Keras that we have uh, SGD learning rate equal to 0 0.01, so they're also using this momentum thing, which we'll discuss shortly. And then there is a DK 0.01, and uh, that's how we compile the model here. So, so this says the learning rate is decreased, and again, it's provided in a pretty straightforward way that uh, that equation that we saw some form of it, we're starting with the initial rate epsilon naught. I suppose that equation and this equation uh, are interchangeable. I haven't checked it out carefully, but it might be derivable from the previous equation. And that's what uh, Keras provides for you. What is that? Oh, you are, you are referring to this one here? This is this equation or the one on top? Uh huh. DK is constant. Yeah, that's right. You're specifying DK equal to 0 0.01, right? And then the iteration comes into play. That is the uh, step tau, right? Yeah. Is that equation and this equation the same? I'm not sure. It, it is. Huh? That equation is stated in terms of alpha and epsilon naught is their initial rate, and tau is the iteration. DK is, uh, I suppose, alpha, right? So it is some version of that equation is being provided uh, uh, as uh, the uh, we are calculating the learning rate here. And the learning rate is, uh, uh, is is for the current epoch. So that's what we're doing. And learning rate is epsilon, actually. Yeah, that's what it is. So there is some version of it. So see if you can you can convert that into this equation. This is the form that they, they make it available. Yeah. 
for a given problem. Yeah. This is, uh, a, a, as I said, uh, an empirical type of thing. And uh, there are all these parameter initializations, are there, that's one thing. And here they're saying a standard way you go between zero and uh, uh, one for zero and one. And typically set at point zero one. You'll find some arguments why that is a good good number. So that seems to be uh, that seems to be the uh, general choice of it, right? You, you know that's all I can say about it. Maybe play around with it and say maybe point zero two is better, all right? So okay, so and yeah, there's some empirical issues here, but there is a lot of theory trying to trying to argue, you know. We might at superficially say, well, you know, what is this ad hoc point zero? You know, like say pk equal to point zero one. Where do you get that from? Or a learning rate, where do you get this point zero one from here? Yeah, that's what you're asking this question. They're saying, well, this is based on lots of experiments people have done. That seems to be a, a reasonable thing. But uh, yeah. Or if you do, if you think that's ad hoc, maybe you should go to the second order methods and say that might be fixed more in uh, in in good theory. This one is, is based on some experimentation. What should it be? Right. Okay, so SGD, so that's all about SGD, simple uh, stochastic gradient descent. So now we go on to uh, the momentum method. Why we need another method is uh, stochastic gradient descent can be slow, and momentum uh, method uh, accelerates uh, learning when facing high curvature, small but consistent gradients, noisy gradients. Now, they're all problems, high curvature small but no consistent gradient small gradients is an issue in, in learning because you're not moving too much and then if you're noisy gradients um, so how does this work algorithm accumulates a moving average of past gradients and moves in that direction while exponentially decaying so it is keeping track of the values that you're getting and saying there is a certain direction in which i should be going all right so there are some pretty pictures here uh, saying gradient descent with uh, momentum. So we have, this is a cross section. This is a W1, W2 space. Think of it as a two dimensional plane here. And there's a bowl sitting on top of it. And we are somewhere on this bowl here and we are trying to go to the, the minimum here. In a two dimensional uh, plane, we can only show it like this. So this bowl is sitting on top. These are all the contours of constant density on the bowl. And here we're starting out somewhere on the top of the bowl and uh, it is proceeding like that uh, when you when you perform uh, standard stochastic gradient descent and we're taking uh, large steps in w2 direction and small steps in w1 direction and this you know it could be happening that we're taking small steps in this direction which is actually where most of the activity is you have to go from here to here rather than going up you know, up and down, that is the W2 direction. We want to go in the W1 direction in large steps. So that is corrected by the momentum method. It reduces oscillations in the W2 directions and uh, proceeds to this point. Uh, so this is, so here is the minimum and gradient descent, standard gradient descent is going like that. And a momentum method, I suppose it started in a different point, not the same point here. It's kind of going in a, less of an oscillation is taking place in the momentum method and uh, so we can set a higher learning rate so the momentum method seems to somehow control this uh, oscillation and slowness by uh, by taking into account uh, where is the minimum which direction is the minimum happening and so how do we define that mathematically is the next part talks about it introdu introduces a variable v or velocity the direction and speed at which parameters move through the parameter space Isn't that interesting we are bringing in concepts of uh, physical movement into something uh, to an algorithm now right it's the kind of same thing we are moving in 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 space here and so we are, we are coming in, in, in with ideas of uh, velocity and uh, mo and the word momentum is a word uh, borrowed from physics, which is uh, momentum is defined in physics as a mass times velocity, right? And uh, the momentum algorithm assumes the unit mass. So a hyperparameter alpha determines exponential decay. So there's an alpha, there is a, there is a hyperparameter comes into play here also. And the update rule is now given by uh, velocity has an alpha v, and then there is the function, there's a derivative of that. 
there's a learning rate associated with it and we update the parameter uh, using uh, uh, the velocity as well as the uh, the value of the uh, derivative here of the loss function it accumulates the gradient element that's what v is doing it accumulates the gradient elements and the larger the alpha is relative to epsilon the uh, uh, more previous gradients affect the current direction and so now we not only have uh, a learning rate epsilon we also have a hyperparameter alpha now that's telling you how important this velocity uh, is an issue here and so the algorithm now so we saw the algorithm for sgd this is sgd with momentum looks uh, similar mini batch and all that you compute the gradient and we have an update this this line is uh, added on here which uh, is the velocity term coming into play and we apply an update to the parameters theta and uh, in keras you can specify uh, the learning rate can be specified by by the lr argument and the momentum can be specified by the momentum argument so you're saying learning rate i want 0.01 as the hyperparameter and the momentum i want it to be 0.9 as a hyperparameter and then we compile so well if you don't like these values try out some other values but uh, th there are some guidelines for this I, I got some of these things from the keras manual there's a very nice online uh, manual on Keras about all the optimizers and, and some guidelines about the choice of these parameters and all that. So I suppose it has come from a lot of people experimenting with them. And this picture shows the uh, stochastic gradient descent with momentum, uh, the movement to the, to the uh, minimum here, and in comparison to SGD, uh, without, without momentum is making lots of little steps here. Whereas the one with momentum is kind of uh, doesn't make that many oscillations and goes uh, faster. Um, let's see, there are some caveats here with a poorly conditioned Hessian red path. Um, uh, deputy quadratic loss with a poorly, okay, in this case, we say a poorly conditioned Hessian matrix and the red path cutting across defect followed the momentum as okay. I suppose it's saying even with a, with a uh, poorly conditioned Hessian matrix, this is doing fine. And, uh, and in this case, uh, with a poorly conditioned Hessian, uh, it, uh, poor, uh, the quadratic objective looks like a long, narrow valley with steep sides, waste time. Okay. So poorly conditioned Hessian, that is the curvature is something, is a very peculiar, right? it's, a, it's a huge, uh, narrow valley with steep sides. Right? It's an interesting, uh, you know, physical description of how that, parameter uh, space looks like and uh, that takes a hell of a lot of time to navigate whereas uh, something like like uh, SGD with momentum seems to do better when you have uh, the second derivatives uh, uh, make it difficult and there's a third method called nester of momentum which um, alpha and epsilon play a similar role as the standard momentum method and uh, in the Nesterov uh, method uh, uh, is that uh, Nesterov gradient is evaluated after the current velocity is applied. And uh, so there is a, some order change over here. So uh, let's look at the algorithm. Maybe I'm not sure whether these equations show it nicely. But uh, what we're doing here is in the Nesterov algorithm, this is SGD with Nesterov momentum. So there is some kind of an interim update is made here. Uh, and then you compute the gradient here. So there is some order change taking place. And uh, so this is a correction that was provided, uh, named after somebody called Nestrov, Nestrov momentum. All right. So again, in Keras, you have uh, all of this available. The so learning rate you have to specify, momentum you have to specify, and then Nestroff is Boolean, whether to apply Nestroff momentum or not. So there's an on-off, do you want Nestroff or do you don't want Nestroff? And, uh, and then learning rate, you have to specify, momentum you have to specify as a hyperparameter here. Okay. All right. So these are, these are some of the standard choices for uh, gradient descent. But we're not done with the optimizers. We still are going on to the adaptive methods. Okay, that's probably what comes up next. Uh, 
So that is about this topic of basic optimization algorithms. By the way, I, I am putting these things again as a reminder uh, within our Piazza section here. So I'm, I'm putting the dates also, so you know what the material is. So we 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 finished some early part of optimization, and then uh, today we covered basic optimization. There is a topic of parameter initialization. And then there is uh, adaptive learning. These are the four methods, including Adam optimizer. And then there is the second order methods, right? So, all right. What's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not able to understand what you're saying. Hmm? Oh, you're talking about syllabus for the quiz. Oh, okay, okay. For uh, Wednesday, it will be on optimization. You know what has happened? <laughs> it started in one way. Uh, what is happening is uh, my subjects are getting divided between between now Wednesday and Monday. So we started optimization on uh, last Wednesday. <laughs> Today we are wrapping up optimization. So the quiz on Wednesday will be just on optimization. Maybe in a way it's not too bad because it's not like you know, you still have, you know, uh, tomorrow, today and tomorrow to look over the material on optimization, right? Right. Okay. I'm just giving you the same question. It was funny that in the beginning, when I gave the questions, I think I mentioned it to you already. I mean, I gave the questions, I gave, I made up all these questions last semester uh, when I taught it. And then when I showed the first set of questions to the TAs, they said, these questions are too easy for our students. They're all so brilliant. They're all you know, toppers and gate exam, you're asking them what is matrix multiplication, they know all that stuff. You can ask them more about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, that is more to their level of uh, challenge. And so they, they change the questions on me. And then subsequent weeks, uh, I gave the same questions from last week. They said, oh, no, no, these are good. So, so we're kind of, you're getting the same questions uh, I made up last semester. And uh, actually there I made the first quiz on on uh, linear algebra, somewhat easy. Uh, I was concerned about the students finding the uh, first quiz itself uh, impossible to do and drop the course or whatever, right? It was, uh, and I didn't want to give an eigenvalue as the very first question uh, when you start the semester. I mean, eigenvalues are important, but you know you can do without it for most of deep learning. Uh, and that there are going to be some, uh, you know, when you're trying to explain explain the, uh, the nature of the uh, uh, loss function and you have to look at the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, you know, that's that fine detail is not necessarily the first thing you need to know about. But I think it's an important concept enough uh, that it's fair enough to know about it. So anyway, you're getting the same questions that I made up for optimization. Uh, it's been, it's been time tested now, I guess over one semester, you made it up just last semester. So you're getting it now to see how it is. Um, yeah, I, I'm always trying to improve it for the next portion of it, right? Next time, next time I do it, it's going to be based on some, some feedback. <laughs> this was, this was a poor question. Mm -hmm. What is that? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, uh, that's our class time, right? With 11 to 12:30, right? But some other class is being held. Yeah. Or before the class, okay. Then there will be nobody left in the class, right? <laughs> <laughs> I will also have to go to the other lecture with you. <laughs> At least to keep your attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a logistic issue. All right, let me just think about it. Okay. Come in the beginning, okay? Maybe we'll do it. All right. Okay, what do we want? Light slideshow, okay. Parameter initialization strategy. What, what can we say about this topic? Hmm. All right. So what is this about initialization? And it says, uh, well, then if you are using a non-iterative optimization, in many problems in machine learning, the solution 
can be obtained non-iteratively. A closed form solution exists for a linear regression problem. If you want to determine uh, what is the value of the parameters at which the loss function is minimum, and you're using linear regression, you're using sum of squared errors, uh, then it is possible to state the problem in a closed form solution, which involves, uh, uh, first you have the design matrix, you have the rows and the columns corresponding to the samples and the features, and uh, you just need to take the design matrix and you need to invert that design matrix. How can you invert a design matrix when it is not a square matrix? So, well, you make a more pin, pin rows inverse of the non-square matrix and uh, you would uh, you would use that uh, product of the uh, of these uh, terms and that will give you a solution saying here is a set of uh, values for the weights that's a closed form solution it's non iterative but uh, why do we uh, still uh, insist on having an iterative solution even for regression problems uh, is that uh, uh, again issues with the matrix right it's uh, uh, poorly conditioned matrix and so on there so it's not always possible to have a non-iterative uh, optimization. Okay, so the first point that's being said here is simply solve for the solution point. Okay, cannot solve always. Um, but what about iterative methods? Iterative methods start out with some solution and then keep on improving upon it to minimize the loss function. And they iterative but converge regardless of initialization, acceptable solutions and acceptable times. So it doesn't matter, it always finds it's a nice bowl shaped convex uh, surface you're dealing with, it is always going to find the right point. Uh, and uh, the third point is uh, iterative, but affected by choice of initialization. And it says deep learning falls in this last category that uh, deep learning algorithms are iterative. And uh, initialization determines whether it converges at all and can determine how quickly learning converges. So there are different points. You're dealing with a surface with all kinds of bumps here. It's not a, it's not a simple bowl here. It depends on whether you start here or you start here or start there and so on. So our deep learning has this issue. And this is one of the things we talked about in bagging methods saying, start with this initialization, start with that initialization and uh, maybe merge the two or combine the two. So again, there are all these practical things have been thought about. And like Kera says, um, Kera's initializer, kernel initializer, random uniform, and bias initializer zero. So you're saying about, so they're dealing separately with the weights and the bias. And sometimes we think of it as together, uh, bias are a small number of them. So initializes, uh, initialization differ the way to set the initial random weights. And, uh, and this is how it is defined in Kera. So it's done for you. Uh, I was just looking into what are, what's all available in the Kera's library. They say you can have zeros, you can have ones, you can have constants, you can have random normal, random uniform, truncated normal, uh, vary, variant scaling, orthogonal, identity, Likud uniform. So uh, all of these uh, are invoked uh, in this manner for uh, the kind of initialization you want. And some of them have more parameters than the others. Simply zeros and ones are pretty straightforward. And uh, so... If, so what is the starting point for the loss function is, is what we're asking. These are all methods here. And um, so what are the modern initializers? So how did they come up with all of this? They're simple and heuristic and based on achieving nice properties. But the problem is a difficult one, the initialization. Some initial points are beneficial for optimization, but de detrimental to generalization. That's an interesting point that uh, overfitting issues here. And uh, they looked into it, breaking symmetry. One property known with certainty is uh, initial parameters must be chosen to break symmetry. If two hidden units are the same inputs and the same activation function, then they must have different initial parameters. So that's one guideline. And best to initialize each unit to compute a different function. This uh, motivates use of random initialization parameters. So this is saying random initialization parameters might be a good idea. And then um, biases. Biases for each unit. And remember, you can get rid of bias terms by simply adding one more feature as input with a uh, unit value. And you don't need to deal with biases. But uh, these things seem to use bias explicitly uh, and so on. Next, So that's one issue. Weights drawn from a Gaussian. All right, so here are some words on that. 
and uh, heuristics for initial scale of the weights. There are some heuristics based on some good statistical theory here. And then again, initialization for the biases. Not much being said here, other than saying that uh, uh, there are nice library functions that helps you initialize to different things. It's about parameter initialization. Okay, the next one is an important one, adapt adaptive rates. Okay, so here, here we are on the optimization topic, algorithms with adaptive learning rates. So Ada grad, RMS prop, Adam. But if you go to the Keras library, it has a lot more than these three. These are the three more important ones. There are like another three or four methods available. Right? I guess people come up with some new method and say, hey, this works well, write a paper about it, <laughs> and then you make it available uh, in GitHub and and so these are all available today in Kera. So anyway, these are the three of the more famous ones. And then there is a topic which comes to our rescue saying, how do you choose this? Choosing the right optimization algorithm uh, among all these. Second order, they put it away separately. That's a different class of methods. All the basic ones, which are all based on gradient descent and variance, momentum, Nesterov. And we got three famous ones here. So let's take a quick look at what these are. So... Okay, the overview statement is uh, the most difficult hyperparameter to set. It significantly affects model performance. Really sensitive to some directions in parameter space and insensitive to others. And momentum helps, but introduces another hyperparameter. Should you use momentum? Because you are bringing in one more hyperparameter to play. And uh, is there another way? If uh, direction of sensitivity is axis aligned, Separate learning rate for each parameter and adjust them throughout learning. So for each parameter has a separate uh, learning rate as opposed to one learning rate for the entire vector. So some heuristic uh, approaches here. Okay, I think it's one of the older methods, dar, delta bar delta algorithm, applicable only to full batch optimization. Let's ignore that because Keras didn't seem to offer that at all. Uh, and so more recent incremental mini batch methods are, are these three Adagrad, RMS prop, and Adam. And okay, this is what I found in Keras. So they have uh, RMS prop, Adagrad, there's something called Ada Delta, Adam, Ada Max. And Adam seems to be a nester of uh, Adam optimization. Adam stands for adaptive, adaptive method. Okay, adaptive method some combinations that come in. So the momentum method is coming back to play here into uh, in these adaptive methods. So it's a combination of momentum and adaptive method. And some of these er earlier ones are simply uh, adaptive rates. So let's see, what is the theory here, Ada grad. It uh, individually accepts learning rates for all parameters by square, scaling them inversely proportional some of the historical squared values of the gradient. So uh, it has uh, a method where, uh, okay, let's look at the last part. We are updating the parameters here. And uh, how do we update it? There is some uh, interesting coin operator coming into play here, which is called uh, element-wise multiplication of the gradient uh, with some quantity here. What is that quantity? Accumulate uh, uh, squared gradient. There's again, gradient square. How is that defined? When you compute the gradient, that is simply the standard derivative of the likelihood function summed over all the samples. So there are m samples here. So that is the gradient. That is the mini batch, which is sampling the mini batch of examples. That's what we're doing here, mini batch of the samples. Right? The supervised learning problem. There's a y coming into play here. and uh, so gradient accumulate requires small, a small constant delta, perhaps 10 to the minus 7 for numerical ability. So there's a global learning rate uh, epsilon, and uh, we have an initial parameter theta. So uh, we are uh, doing some kind of an update that's taking place. Um, I'm not seeing here that the learning rate in the, in the eta grad uh, coming into play at all. The epsilon is not being changed. It's a fixed uh, fixed learning rate, but that is 
what is being used here i suppose in the repeated repeated uh, use of it the learning rate keeps changing yeah ah no you know this is a this is a new mathematical operation that machine learning people have defined in a product they're all, they're all standard math right so these guys said, uh, what about multiplying, if I give you two matrices, multiplying corresponding elements. So that is that type of operation here, right? Element-wise operation. Gradient, uh, again, I suppose you have two, uh, G is a, is a gradient vector. If you multiply terms, um, each element, um, that is not defined by inner product or outer product, right? Inner, inner product gives you a scalar, and outer product gives, gives you a matrix. This uh, multiplication gives, multiplying two vectors gives you uh, a vector. Same length vector, yeah, yeah. So this, I think I mentioned it already in the early in the class. It's got a name, right? What is it called? Hmm? Hedamard, Hedamard multiplier, yeah, Hedamard, Hedamard multiplication. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, machine learning people are redefining you know, linear algebra sometimes, you know, which I mean, they didn't find a need for it. They only deal, dealt with vectors, vector multiplication and, yeah, inner product and outer product. So this is one more type of product. Yeah. All of Newton's, uh, not Newton, no, no, Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations all use vectors, right, in vector multiplication. And they also didn't need, 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 need these things. Maxwell's equations are among the most important fundamental scientific thing that have been discovered by human beings. It's really something, you know. There's a building in Washington, D.C. called the National Academy of Sciences building. You enter this building, there's an atrium. They have thought about what are the most important scientific discoveries that scientists have discovered over all these years, what are the most important things? And one of them uh, prominently is Darwin, right? Darwin's uh, theory of evolution is one of the most important scientific discoveries. And then all over the place, on the floor, on the wall, uh, on, the, on the ceiling also, I think, there are all these things. So they've chosen which are the most important scientific discoveries. Uh, theory of evolution is an important one. And then another one, Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations uh, play a role there about electromagnetism and all that, right? Discovering, uh, discovering Wi-Fi, basically. Right? And um, uh, yeah, uh, Maxwell's equations are one, other, one of them. Maybe I think uh, Newton's laws. Maybe Newton's laws or like that. They have some equa uh, e equal to mc squared, of course, right? Theory of relativity. That equation is prominently there. This is a. This is a famous discovery that it's very interesting to walk through to say what are the most important uh, scientific discoveries and they chose them and they embedded them into the wall and all that by the way here at uh, indian institute of science i find it very nice that uh, in almost all the departments there is a portrait of somebody who contributed a lot to their discipline right if you go to the uh, third floor here in the csa building there's a portrait there right of who there's Alan Turing, there's a portrait of Alan Turing, he's the most fundamental discovery. You go to the ECE department, Electrical Communication Engineering Department, there's a bust of somebody, right? Hmm? Who's that? Yeah, it's Hertz, it's uh, Heinrich Hertz. Heinrich Hertz's uh, bust is there. And why did they choose Heinrich Hertz? Is uh, because he's the one, he, Maxwell's equations were already there, it's about electromagnetism. And uh, it was actually Heinrich Hertz who actually uh, practically showed that Max, whatever Maxwell equations predicted would hold true about electromagnetic waves. And, you know, it's about, uh, it's about the nature of Wi-Fi today, right? So who was the one who first discovered the nature of uh, radio waves and, and so on? Uh, that's why they've chosen uh, Heinrich uh, Hertz there. And the third department I went to was, uh, I went to the biological sciences department last week here. And there is a, 
you know, India's largest uh, herbarium is, is over there in, in, in the biological science, CB, they call it. They have, uh, they have 20,000 plants uh, documented there. They have samples of 20,000 plants in their herbarium. And there's a portrait again of somebody as to uh, who's the one who kind of did all the very fundamental work in this area. And that turns out to be a person called uh, William Roxburgh. He was the considered the father of Indian botany. He's the one who first studied all the plants of India and documented it and cataloged it and so on. So it's kind of very nice that you have these things on every. Um, I, now I need to go to every department and see who's your father figure in your department, right? <laughs> I've seen three already. I've seen three: Turing and Henrik Hertz and and William Roxburgh. Chemistry, I don't know. Maybe, you know there might be some someone there, an inspiring figure. Anyway, why did I go to the side here? Because <laughs> this multiplication is not needed in Maxwell's equation. Only you need vectors and vectors and inner product and outer product to define Maxwell's equations. What is this RMS prop? I'm not getting into every a little detail here, but it seems like so many of these. Uh, it modifies Ada grad. Ah, oh, all it is is an improvement of Ada grad. So we don't need to look at Ada grad at all. Change gradient accumulation into exponentially weighted moving average converges rapidly when applied to a convex function. Wow, this seems to be, uh, uh, you know, replacing eta grad. You don't need to work with eta grad. RMS prop seems to be a good, uh, good method. And so this is what's going on in these equations here is uh, accumulated uh, squared gradient. And uh, okay, RMS prop combined with Nestorov momentum. So yeah, these things are all not uh, left by the wayside. They're all being uh, leveraged here. So you can get uh, all of it together in one package. It's got uh, RMS prop with Nestorov momentum, taking advantage of the speed and you're taking advantage of uh, reducing the, uh, the learning rate. So RMS prop is popular. So <laughs> This depends on uh, who you ask uh, uh, and then when you ask the question. I think this is now about three, four years old now. And so RMF prop is an effective practical optimization algorithm, even called go-to optimization for deep learning practitioners. It would be nice to go and search on this topic. And is that still true? After four years of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of students trying out all these methods and say, are they still saying RMS prop is the most popular? Uh, so Adam, Adam seems to be even more popular, variant of RMS prop with momentum. It seems like you have, you have this uh, method that is an adaptive method you're bringing in. Uh, so generally robust to the choices of the hyperparameters. And so this is the famous Adam optimizer. This is what that looks like. Correct bias in the first moment, correct bias in the second moment. Updated bias. All right, so it's working with uh, moment variables, it says. So it requires uh, moment estimates, row one and row two, and so on. And uh, so this is uh, moment, I suppose, refers to the momentum issue here. And uh, it is computing all of these, again, element-wise operations uh, here. Okay, in the G, G, Hedamard, G. I don't know how you would even read it. G times G in Hedamard. Okay, fortunately for us, uh, something comes to the rescue saying, how good are these? So people have done some experiments and compared MNIST, the handwritten digit problem, training costs, iterations over data set, Adagrad, SGD, Nesterov, and Adam, and how quickly they converge. Adagrad was slow, SGD, Nesterov. Adam seems to be the best. Ah, okay. So the more complicated algorithm seems to be the best. And uh, this is another one, IMDP, uh, bag of words, feature logistic regression. And uh, here, oh wow, this is, uh, the best seems to be Adam plus dropout, SGD Nestra plus dropout, and RMS prop dropout. So it, this, the winner here doesn't seem to be the winner over here. Uh, logistic regression training, negative log likelihood and MNIST images, and IMDB movie reviews with uh, 10,000 bag of words. So this was about uh, about MNIST handwritten digit images. This was about on movie reviews. 
and uh, seems like uh, here the Adam plus dropout or the other blue one is Ada grad plus dropout. So these are some numbers here. And uh, uh, performance of multi layer neural networks. I don't see much difference here in this slide in the previous one. Convolutional neural networks again. And the Adam optimizer generally seems to be doing well here in terms of uh, the training cost is reduced, reduced uh, uh, compared to some of the other methods. They're not finding, finding the, the best solution here. And uh, CIFAR 10, that is about the real world images. These are all CIFAR 10. Those are all the pictures of photographs of dogs and cats and ships and so on. And Okay, this slide says choosing the right optimizer. We discussed several methods of optimizing, adapting learning rate, which algorithm to choose. Ah, there is no consensus. Most popular algorithms actively use SGT, SGT with momentum, RMS prop, RMS prop with momentum, Ada, Delta, and Adam. Choice depends on users' familiarity with the algorithm. That's a pretty weak statement. Um, all right, I'm still looking for a good scientific answer to this question. You know, that's what's happening today is people are studying all these methods and reporting something more concrete, saying, okay, there's an open problem. We don't know how to choose these things. Maybe there are some right directions, all right? And uh, the next slide, I'm not going to go over uh, that slowly. It's just uh, mainly... Uh, Second order methods are, uh, have always intrigued me. So, second order methods are very easy to uh, understand if you first look at uh, Newton's method for finding the roots of an equation. They give you a, a quadratic and ask you at what value of x is this uh, is this expression going to be zero, right? And a good method for that is uh, to draw the curve and take derivatives, uh, and you draw a tangent to the to the curve and see uh, where it intersects the the x-axis. Let's say we are we are plotting y against x. There's some function here, and we want to say what value of uh, of uh, uh, where, at what value of x is y going to go to zero? So uh, how do you solve that problem? And uh, and you can solve that problem by, by drawing a tangent to the curve at some arbitrary point. You start an arbitrary point, draw a tangent, and see where it intersects. And you proceed in that direction. And uh, that invariably finds you. So Newton's method is based on derivative. And uh, typically in machine learning, we are looking at uh, the value uh, of... Uh, of, uh, and, and that that can be re-expressed in terms of the second derivative if the function you are dealing with is when the derivative is equal to zero. A lot of these minimization problems involve asking a question uh, of computing the derivative and asking it what value. This is maxima minima, right? We When we're trying to find a maxima minima of some function, what do we do? We say, well... Uh, uh, at a maxima or minima, the first derivative is going to be equal to zero. Isn't that right? So you first take the first derivative of that equation and then ask the question, at what value is this going to be zero? So you are asking for a zero of a derivative. So if you're going to be asking for the zero of a derivative, uh, Newton's method says if you're looking for a zero of any function, you take its derivative. So we're putting two things together. So to find where it is a maximum minima, you need derivative. To find out where it's going to be equal to zero, then you need a derivative. So derivative of derivative becomes second derivative. So you can think about where does second derivative come into play? And uh, another way to look at it is uh, Taylor's equation, Taylor series. And uh, so second order methods, like if you're starting at X naught and you're looking to go to the minimum, a plane gradient would be that green curve. It's going this way, that way, this way, that way, this way. Okay, there it is, the zero. Uh, and a method called conjugate gradient kind of takes the red line. Second order method goes from X naught directly to the 
solution. It offers that possibility that you are jumping in one step using second derivative. And uh, how does that come into play? We have a loss function here, which is expressed as an expected value over all the samples of the loss function for each sample here. And you take that loss function and let's, let's call that as f of theta. And uh, we are saying, okay, whatever be your f of theta, I can write it in that way. Let's say j of theta is the loss function. I can write it in Taylor series as j theta naught at some point. And then there is uh, theta minus theta naught, first derivative delta, theta minus theta naught, second derivative h, which is the Hessian. And I write approximately equal to because we are ignoring the third derivative. So, so this is standard application of Taylor series to a function which is the loss function. And uh, that particular equation solving for the critical point of the function, we obtain the Newton parameter update rule. It says the theta star you're looking for, the ideal set of parameters is any set of parameters you start with the initial value. Take the derivative of the loss function there, multiply it by the inverse of the Hessian, that's the second derivative. So curvature is coming into play here. So this says there is a closed form solution to your problem of solving directly, right? This is a quadratic function by rescaling the gradient uh, by h inverse, Newton's method directly jumps to the minimum. If objective function is convex but not quadratic, this update can be iterated yielding the training algorithm. So here is a training algorithm associated with Newton's method. Newton's method involves computing the gradient and it was involves computing the Hessian. Gradient is involved first derivative. This involves the second derivative. Right. So as long as the Hessian remains positive, definite, a uh, Newton's method can be applied iteratively. It's a two-step procedure. First update the inverse Hessian, second update the parameters. So there are the issues about regularizing the Hessian. So conjugate gradients is another method that goes step by step by step in some kind of an improvement efficiently. So the issues here may be the direct computing the, uh, uh, the inverse of the Hessian. And that issue is being tackled here. And it leads to this so-called conjugate directions. You're going in, in orthogonal directions, which leads to the conjugate gradient algorithm. And there's another one called the BFGS algorithm, which is also a second order method. Okay, I don't have nice conclusions on that statement, but uh, seems like they've been kind of left, be left behind. So it's an intriguing thought for you to say, ah, I like this, I like Newton. Newton goes back to 1600s, basic idea of Newton's uh, uh, second derivative, uh, Newton's method of finding the roots of an equation play such a central role in a very sophisticated algorithm, uh, which is uh, an optimization, all right? So that's the conclusion of this topic of optimization. Uh, is uh, 